Dinosaurs have captured our hearts and imaginations as some of God's greatest creations. Our next guest will guide us on a tour of dinosaur paleontology, answering many frequently asked questions along the way. How do paleontologists know about dinosaurs and how to reconstruct them? The answers will surprise you. Coming up next on today's edition of Origins, Dinosaurs Demystified with Dr. Marcus Ross. Hello my friends and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. During this program we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Our guest today, Dr. Marcus Ross, received his PhD in geoscience from the University of Rhode Island. He's an associate professor of geology at Liberty University where he also is the Assistant Director of the Center for Creation Studies. Dr. Ross, it's good to have you with us today. Very good to be here, thank you. We're gonna talk about dinosaurs. We and are. I've noticed talking to you off camera that uh, your eyes kinda light up when we get to dinosaurs. They, they've played a part in, for, in forming who you are, haven't they? They, they sure have. I, I'm the sort of kid who caught the dinosaur bug when I was little. Yeah. Uh, I was four and a half years old when I first learned about dinosaurs. And, I was seven years old when I learned the word paleontologist and that there were actually scientists who studied dinosaurs. And then you wanted to be one. And from that point on, it was just the trajectory. Wow. Um, even the, the high school yearbook, you know, my goal was to be a paleontologist. I was that nerdy that, wow. you know, that, that was what was in the high school yearbook. So yes, it's been a good journey. Well, it's fun to talk about, to people about things they're passionate about. So talk to us about dinosaurs demystified. So uh, this talk, this is going to be a romp. We're going to have just a fun run okay. through a whole bunch of, of different types of dinosaurs that are out there, what they were like, and, and uh, those sorts of things. So kind of the, the overall you know, outline that we have here is first to cover what dinosaurs are and, and why we know what we do know about them, um, and then hit some of the major types of dinosaurs and see some nice, good photographs and pretty pictures of stuff, and then talk a little bit about what dinosaurs were like. How did they act? How did they behave? And how do we know that as paleontologists, as scientists? So what is a dinosaur? Uh, right? When I was a little kid at four and I got interested in this, the first thing that I asked for was, you know, the bag o dinosaurs, the little plastic thing with, you know, the, the purple colored T-Rex and the yeah. orange trachodon that looked like it was in a karate pose or something like uh -huh. that. And in that bag is a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't dinosaurs. So like the woolly mammoth and uh, sailback dimetrodon, a whole bunch of things that were dinosaurs and weren't. So how do we actually define dinosaurs? So dinosaurs were land-dwelling animals. They are what are called diapsids. Those are the reptiles that have two pairs of holes in their heads where muscles go. One pair of holes is up on the top back of the skull. The other pair of holes is in the back side of the skull. So diapsid means basically two windows, two pairs of windows. But there's lots of different diapsids out there. Lizards are diapsids and crocodiles are diapsids. And so lizards aren't dinosaurs. Lizards are in the group that's more similar to the um, crocodiles. So dinosaurs and pterodactyls and crocodiles form a group that we call archosaurs. So what we do is we take you know, reptiles, diapsids, dinosaurs. We're getting more, uh, more narrowed with our definition. So Dinosaurs are actually you know, even further defined on the basis of uh, a couple of different physical features that they have in terms of the bones, Now, because bones is mostly what we have of the dinosaurs. So um, one of the figures from a dinosaur textbook that's used uh, quite a bit um, by Fostovsky and Weishampel notes a couple of things, A, B, C, D, and E here. And, and just a couple of these, A is um, a little wing on the humerus. That's the upper arm bone, and there's a, an extension of that that goes towards the chest. Um, in the second part, that's the hip structure. The upper part of the hip bone has got a kind of a crest. That's what C is. And the B is the hip socket. That's so where the, the femur goes inside. Um, there's an opening in there. It's called a perforated acetabulum. The acetabulum is the name for the cup. Sounds like a bad word, but it's okay. You know, <laughs> but uh, they've got a cup for where the, the femur goes in, and then there's a hole in that. And so dinosaurs have that feature. Non-dinosaur animals don't have this 
suite of features. So there's a bunch of different physical forms and, and parts that help define what a dinosaur is, and that way we can say this is a dinosaur, but some of the other things aren't. Now, where are the dinosaurs found? Well, the easy answer for that one is pretty well everywhere. Yeah. Uh, dinosaurs are found on every single continent, including Antarctica. There, there are dinosaurs that are known from that continent. Uh, not too many paleontologists make their way down there, uh, but they have been found there. And when we try and think of dinosaurs in terms of a geological context and a biblical context for this, for Noah's flood, um, we've got a group of names in a column uh, that geologists think of. And the top three names there are Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And each of those refer to the types of life forms that are found in these stacks of rocks. And uh, the Paleozoic has mostly fish and some amphibians. The Mesozoic is that age of reptiles. And it's the Mesozoic rocks that are the rocks that contain the dinosaurs. And above the rocks that have dinosaurs are rocks that usually have mammals or something like that. Those are the Cenozoic rocks. Now, I think that the Paleozoic rocks and the Mesozoic rocks were d made during Noah's flood and that some of the stuff below is mostly creation week rock, and some of the stuff that's above it is uh, the, the age of mammal stuff is probably the post-flood world. Although in creationism, we have a lot of debate as to where to draw the line between where the end of the flood is and the beginning of the world after the flood. But as a kind of basic to understand the geologic column and where the fossils are and where the dinosaurs are, dinosaurs are in the upper part of the flood rocks that we find in, around the world. So, on to the next part of the big issues. I'm going to run over to the screen here to kind of yeah. walk our way through some of these, uh, these issues. So the question that we've got here is, what do we know about dinosaurs, and how do we know about that? Well, uh, here's a dig site from one of my good friends, Dr. Art Chadwick. He's a professor and a geologist. He brings his students and uh, volunteers out to a uh, dinosaur dig site in Wyoming every year through his university, and they've been doing this for almost 20 years now. Fantastic place to learn about digging dinosaurs. So, I mean, dinosaurs are found in the rocks, and here we've got, you know, some big leg bones of uh, horned dinosaurs or some of the duck-billed dinosaurs that they're excavating. So, you know, you got to get the, the fossils out of the rocks so that we can start to study them and understand what they, they come from. Now, our understanding of dinosaurs has changed a lot from the 1800s to today. The word dinosaur was coined um, in about 1850 or so and uh, to unify a group of animals. This is actually the same animal, but these are oh. different representations of what people thought that animal looked like when they were first found. This is the dinosaur Iguanodon, which we now know has a spike for a thumb, but when the first few bits and pieces of the fossils were found, um, they only found some of the spike a little bit of the jaw, some of the ribs, and a vertebrae. And from that, the scientist who was working at the time, Gideon Mantell, he recognized that this was a reptile. And he recognized it was big and that it ate plants. And that's pretty impressive for just having a, a couple of bones. That's amazing. But his only comparison were living reptiles. And so he made it look kind of like a giant iguana. And he called it Iguanodon because it has teeth that look very much like an iguana. Well, about uh, 50 years later in Belgium, uh, a whole group of, of new fossils were found, and they were reconstructed to look like this because he had whole skeletons. So he had whole skeletons to work with. This was a scientist by the name of Dalo. So his illustrations look a little bit more like what we expect dinosaurs to look like today, and this kind of view carried on all the way through the 1960s. And today we now know that dinosaurs didn't drag their tails because oh. there are no tail drag marks anywhere. We got lots of dinosaur footprints, but there's no tail. And when we look at the anatomy a little bit better, we realize that there's a whole bunch of little crisscrossing tendons that help hold everything upright. Dalo didn't understand what those were. He actually had to break the tails in order to put them on the ground. So over time, over 200 years, we've learned a lot, and our view of Iguanodon has changed to this point. But it hasn't changed that much from here to here. No. Once you got full skeletons, your ideas of what the animal could look like were much more narrow and much more accurate. So, you know, sometimes we paleontologists get a bad rap. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you guys got a few bones, you reconstructed an animal, you put the head on the wrong side of things. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that has happened, but it, it doesn't. It really did. It, it really did. And there was, a, there was a big fight over a marine reptile. <laughs> Somebody had accidentally put the head on the wrong end. Got to know the head from the tail. You got to do that. And, and that ended up spurring a, a huge rivalry between the two, the two paleontologists at the time, became known as the Bone Wars. But nevertheless, as silly as these kind of cartoons are, our understanding of, of dinosaurs really is wrapped up in a long history and good understandings of comparative anatomy. We don't make this type of mistake anymore.
So when we think about dinosaurs, there's a lot of ones that come to mind, right? T-Rex and, and a bunch of the others from the Jurassic Park series or things like that. So what are the major types of dinosaurs out there? Well, the big divisions that we have of dinosaurs come from the basis of how their hips are structured. And this was first recognized by Owen, who coined the term dinosaurs. He divided them out according to hip structure. He had three dinosaurs to work with. Oh, and yeah. it's amazing, but Owen's classification still holds up today, 160 years later. Wow. So we divide dinosaurs into two big groups. One is called the Ornithischians, and that's a word that means bird hip because the, the hip structure points backwards. So this would be the head of the animal out this way. And the pubis, which is one of the bones, is uh, located um, going from front to back. In other dinosaurs, they're called Saurischians, which means lizard-hipped. And in that case, the pubis points down towards the front of the animal, and the other part, the ischium here, points to the back. So when we think of the bird hip dinosaurs, these aren't the ones that some evolutionists think turned into birds, actually. There's a to total different side of the dinosaur group. One of the ones that I think is most fun are the pachycephalosaurs. When I was a kid, I loved this word because I could say it and none of the adults could. Right? <laughs> kids, kids grab yeah. onto dinosaurs, I think, in part because they're kind of like monsters, but they're real. And then they have these cool names. Pachycephalosaurus means thick-headed reptile. Okay. Uh, a pachycephalosaurus skull is about this big, but it's got eight to ten inches thick wow. bone on the top. So this is just a big battering ram of a, of a thing. And they are about Built 20. Built-in helmet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The NFL's got nothing on these right. guys. So other ornithischians, also bipedal, but sometimes these ones could walk on all fours as well, are some of the familiar duck-billed dinosaurs. Yeah. And uh, some of the most beautiful dinosaurs, in my opinion, are the duck-billed dinosaurs, especially the ones that have the big, huge crests, like this Parasaurolophus. Um, you can see it illustrated here. That, from, from the tip of the snout to the back of the crest, is six feet. Man, that's six huge. feet. And the whole animal is about 35 feet uh, in length. The, the crested duck-billed dinosaurs have this blizzard of, of different designs. And each one of these crests is connected to the nasal cavity. So every time they breathed out hard, it was like a trumpet or a trombone or some other type of, of one. Each species has its own crest. Yeah. And each male and female have their own sounds as well. So if you walked in and you heard a herd of these things going on, it would be a symphony of, of designed beauty of these different animals. Uh, we know that they ate plants because they've got these weird leaf-shaped types of teeth that are frequently in these huge batteries, these big grinding batteries, so that as the top mouth uh, parts came down to the bottom, the food that was in between would get ground in between them and shredded. They couldn't move their jaws side to side like we do. They, they have a simple hinge that just has up and down movement. Um, but by putting these tooth batteries, they could grind their food very efficiently. So even though they were eating conifer needles and things like that, they could get a lot of energy out of them, even though it's a pretty low quality type of plant. More beauty. I, one of the things that I love about dinosaurs is they just, they're expressions of God's creativity. Some of them had horns, some of them had spikes, some of them were walking tanks. The, uh, the um, notosaurs and the ankylosaurs are two tank-like sorts of animals, and the stegosaurs are uh, animals that had huge plates and spines sticking up out of their, uh, their back. Stegosaurus being the biggest of, of them all with also the biggest spines. It's, it's kind of neat. Stegosaurus gives its name to the family, but it's actually one of the weirdest in the whole family by comparison. Those are just some. I mean, just, just scratching the, the surface uh, of the Ornithischians. Now, the Saurischians all have this hip structure where the pubis points forward, but the differences between them are stark because these are the big guys Okay. in some cases, and they're also the smallest of all the dinosaurs we have. Now, the big ones, we think of uh, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus, the old name Brontosaurus, which there's actually some arguments now that Brontosaurus might be a legitimate dinosaur again. We'll see how that turns out. But nevertheless, when we think of the earth-shaking dinosaurs, the biggest animals that have ever lived on land are uh, the sauropods. And uh, the longest one is called Seismosaurus. And believe it or not, it was almost 120 feet long oh my. from tip to tail. And I actually have my students at Liberty paste that out in one of our hallways because sometimes some people ask, well, can dinosaurs fit on the ark? And well, you don't have to bring the 120 foot long I Seismosaurus. Yeah. But even if you did, 
we had one of my students pace it out and say, okay, this is 120 feet. How long was the arc? Well, it was longer than the rest of our building and it went out to the next, you know, into the parking lot. And the student turned and looked at me and said, oh, we're good. <laughs> we're all set. We can put the dinosaurs on the arc because it was three stories tall too. Um, so just, you know, by comparison, Brachiosaurus and some of its very close relatives are probably the most massive animals that have ever lived. They weren't the longest. The longest, longer ones tend to be a bit more lightly built, if you could say that about something that was 40 tons. Some of them even had wild spines and spikes on this. This is a Margosaurus, which is known from South America. It was a bit smaller than the big behemoths that we had here in uh, North America. It was only about 40 feet. Now, for a sauropod, that's modest. But in order to keep itself protected, it had these huge spikes coming off of its, um, off of its neck. But when we think of sauropod, uh, the uh, Ceriscians, we also think about the meat eaters. And again, a wild diversity of different sizes, shapes, crests, ornamentation. But all of these guys are bipedal and almost all of them are carnivores. You've got things like Carnotaurus in South America, which its name means bull lizard because of the huge spikes coming off of its head. Um, Baryonyx, one of my favorite dinosaurs from England, long crocodilian-like face and a huge thick claw and it probably lived in rivers and ate fish. Okay. Um, Allosaurus, this is Ebenezer, which is now on display at the Creation Museum. Uh, and I got to see it before it got on display, um, which was uh, fa fantastic. Allosaurus being one of the best known meat-eating dinosaurs of all time. Lots of specimens of these. And of course, T-Rex. Sue from the Chicago Field Museum, uh, the, one of the largest carnivorous animals ever to walk the earth. Now we get all of these dinosaurs from the flood, so they weren't first created as carnivores, but by the time we get to the flood and the world is filled with violence, that's what we've got. The velociraptors from Jurassic Park are just one of the very many of the raptor dinosaurs that are out there. So, I, and just huge diversity, and uh, you know, in a minute maybe we'll talk about that whole feather thing. All right. Well, there are some big issues that we want to look at, but that's a fascinating overview of, of the incredible variety, and uh, uh, I just love how excited you are about it, and I think our viewers are sharing that. Don't you go away. We'll be back to talk about the issues in just a minute. We are back with Dr. Ross, and so good to have you back down here with me because I have a couple of things I want to know. Uh, what a great review of dinosaurs, and your enthusiasm shines through. But you kind of gave us a review of, of what they looked like, but uh, what did they do? Were they warm-blooded, cold-blooded? How did they act? That, that's, a, that's a really good question. And what we know about dinosaurs goes beyond just the, the physical, how do you put the bones together? Because the bones tell stories. Okay. Um, and there's things that uh, you can look at under the microscope. There's things about the way the bones are organized or what you find with other things that help you reconstruct you know, what life was like uh, for a dinosaur. And so now dinosaurs were mostly large. And the, there's a uh, paper that was uh, published by one of my colleagues at the Institute for Creation Research, Dr. Uh, Tim Clary and Jeff Tompkins. And they both went through and did a very strong summary of the size ranges of dinosaurs to answer some questions about how many are gonna you know, be on the ark, those types of issues. And what they discovered was that the, the median dinosaur size, so you know, right down the middle, half the dinosaurs are smaller, half the dinosaurs are bigger. That median value is 630 kilograms. Now for us Americans, you know, that we're talking almost 1,500 pounds. So that's big. You know, that's the size of, uh, of an American bison uh, or so. So you're talking about a fairly large animal. Um, now, the strange thing about this is that the distribution of the dinosaurs doesn't follow one of those nice normal curves. It's actually split apart where you've got a big hump in terms of uh, smaller animals and a big hump in terms of bigger ones. So there's not many animals that are actually in the middle sure. at that 630 kilograms. You've got a camel hump, a double uh, camel hump, mostly small or mostly large between those. So that still gives us lots of room on the ark. Even if we took this and just said, okay, how many dinosaur kinds do we need to put on the ark? Um, can we fit them on the ark? No problem at all. Now onto that question of hot or cold-blooded. 
Uh, this is a, a picture of dinosaur bone that is um, sliced down through so that you can see into the bone. And what we can see here a bit is the, the hard and compact bone on the outside and this more open bone on the inside. And these little dots uh, and circles and open holes, uh, especially on the outside over here, are areas where blood vessels flow through. And the amount of those helps us to understand how much blood is flowing through the bone and the way that the bone grows. For some animals, bone growth is really slow, and, and uh, so you see almost like tree rings. But for other animals like mammals, bone growth is fast early and then slows down much later on. Dinosaurs look a little bit more like the mammals and bird side of thing than they look like the lizard and cold-blooded type of thing. So, so you think they're, they're warm-blooded? Yeah. Now, so we look at bone structure. Another thing we look at is predator-prey ratios. How many meat-eating dinosaurs are there for the plant-eating dinosaurs? And the ratios look like the African Serengeti. There's a lot more plant-eating dinosaur fossils than there are meat-eating dinosaur fossils. So it gives us an idea of how many, how many carnivores can be supported by the herbivores. And if you need a lot of herbivores to support one carnivore, you're looking at warm-blooded carnivores, not cold-blooded ones. Uh, uh, an African lion will eat 10 times as many uh, 10 times as much food as an equivalent size crocodile. Yeah. So um, their posture is always upright, meaning mechanically it makes more sense for them to, to uh, probably be warm blooded than cold. And also there's an issue of what's called gigantothermy, which is as you get really big, your metabolism helps allow you to maintain a warm blooded system without having to spend as much energy to do so because you're just so big you hold your energy and your heat in better. So there's some advantages to that. We also know that dinosaurs were pretty good parents. Starting off with the work of Jack Horner back in the 70s, he was the model for the Jurassic Park paleontologist. Uh, but even going through to today, um, studies of discovering of dinosaur eggs and shells uh, show us that dinosaurs laid eggs and usually in communal nesting situations, kind of like birds at the shore yeah. will have these big, huge communal systems. The, the dinosaurs seem to do the same thing. So it kind of, it kind of points towards the warm-blooded bird thing, but also tells us about community within the dinosaurs. They're not just aimless animals wandering around. They're in herds, they're in groups, they're in you know, stuff like that. Now, I said we'd talk about the feathers because the Velociraptor had feathers on it. And uh, from what we see, some of those raptor-like dinosaurs are very similar to birds. Um, this is a different type of raptor it's called Microraptor gui. This was discovered in China several years ago. And the neat thing about Microraptor is it was first discovered without fossils and was described as a dinosaur. Then a little bit later on, more fossils were discovered, and it was completely covered with feathers. Oh. All this stuff over here feathers. is feathers everywhere, and sure. they're feathers that look just like flight feathers do today. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that's just you know fluff or fuzz or what have you. These are feathers that would allow Microraptor to glide. <laughs> It wasn't a powered flyer like modern birds are, but Microraptor could probably climb up trees, float from one place to another, and did so with a complement of actual wings. So some of the dinosaurs had feathers, and this is a, um, an oviraptor called City Patty. And what's really neat here is we've got eggs, and note the way that the arms are draped over the nest, like this, when you th and how the legs are tucked underneath when you think of how a bird sits on a nest, it tucks down and then it put its arms yeah. out over to protect it because Noah's flood was coming and destroying its nesting site. Okay. And in another one of these, the head is actually tucked underneath the wing. And we see Just birds do that today. Birds do it today. Yeah. The chickens that I have in my backyard, yeah. going home to roost. Okay. So these are some of the things that we can see about dinosaurs and about how it is that they, um, that they acted and how they behaved so that we have a good understanding of, of what they were like. They hunted in packs, the raptors did at least, and the other animals you know, traveled in herds to help protect themselves from that. So the, the bones tell a lot of stories. They tell us what they looked like, they tell us how to put them together, and they tell, them, tell us a lot about how they interacted with each other and with the world around them as they were being destroyed in the floodwaters uh, of Noah's flood. I'm gonna ask you to do something for me. Uh, forget about all the rest of the viewers. Pretend there's an eight-year-old little boy or an eight-year-old little girl out there who was just fascinated with everything that you yeah. said. What would you want to say to them in one minute? Love God and love his creation. Yeah. And 
set your mind on learning whatever it is that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And if God allows you to continue through that, yeah. then just go for it. Yeah. And be prepared for, uh, you know, be prepared for problems along the way. But God's faithful and He can take your passion and work with it because He is the Lord God Almighty. And you are proof of that. And I'm, so I'm a proof. I not only love what you teach, but I love who you are for our young viewers out there who have a bent towards science. And just because we're creationists doesn't mean we can't love science and be excited about it and, and, and give our lives to investigating it because in seeing the things God made, we see God. Thank you so much for sharing You're with very us. Welcome. And, Thanks and, for being uh, with it's me today. Wonderful to uh, have you share this with our viewers, folks. I just want you to know that God made it. He made it well. He made it an incredible diversity. He made it to declare His glory. You know, it's His view that He made you too, and that should always be your worldview. See you again soon here on Origins. Until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 1507, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.